and introduce everyone formally uh, to our webinar today, which is creating a culture that customers and advisors love. Uh, so delighted to welcome two brilliant speakers today. Um, we've got Sarah Morgan from Lukiat Co Coaching. Had it changed in the background for you. <laughs> Apologies. Um, so welcome, Sarah. Hi. Um, would you like to uh, give everyone who missed it before a bit of an introduction to uh, who you are? Yeah, so um, as I say, I'm Sarah Morgan. I'm founder of Lukiat Coaching. Um, I had 25 years in tech operations, customer ops, customer services, and founded my business at the start of this year because I really wanted to enable leaders to um, be better at work, to be their best selves at work, stop um, getting in their own way. Um, and to be able to build amazing, um, engaged and collaborative teams. Brilliant. Well, we uh, look forward to hearing your presentation shortly. Um, also, welcome back to uh, Mike Murphy from Genesis. Uh, been on many a webinar together. Hi, Mike. Hey, Rachel. Hi, everybody. Good to be here. Good to be back. <laughs> <laughs> and um, for, for those who've missed your introduction, uh, we'd, we'd love to hear it again. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm Mike from Genesis, so I'm the kind of technology input to the, um, to the conversation today. Um, I've, um, I've spent a lot of time in my, well, my whole career really um, around the contact center area, uh, but the last 11 years I've been working with, with a Genesis company. And um, my role is really a, uh, like an onboarding new customers into Genesis role, so it's a sales role. Um, but also here, what we do when we do onboard new customers, we kind of live with them, if you will, through their life. So from that perspective, I've got a, you know, after 11 years, I've got a very nice balance, if you will, of bringing on new uh, kind of all the time, but also then having quite a established amount of people that I talk to who have been working together for maybe up to seven, eight, nine years. So it's really interesting just to kind of compare the, um, the conversations that we have uh, with the various different users at the different stages of their, of their tech usage. Brilliant. Well, welcome to both our speakers. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, before we get into everything, just a reminder or an introduction to some people that we are running a discussion this week on our chat room. Um, it's on callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat, or we do have a short term. It's just cch.chat. Uh, you just need to put in your first name and email. Or, yeah email address as well it is in a separate window so uh, you will have to put uh, the webinar screen and the chat room side by side or you can run the chat room uh, on your mobile phone um, definitely worth logging in I will say there are some added benefits of being in there uh, so later on we are running our quiz uh, there's a bottle of champagne or a box of chocolates or even an Amazon gift card for the winner of our quiz so make sure you pay attention to what we're discussing today. Uh, these are the, um, the buttons to take part. Uh, but we also have the option to download the webinar slides of both our speakers. Lots of information on there, so I definitely recommend downloading them. Um, and the other added bonus of being in the chat room is that we're running our usual um, champagne box of chocolates or Amazon gift card for the best tip. So if you use hashtag question to ask our panel a question or use hashtag tip to share your top tips for uh, improving culture or what you've been doing. Uh, so just a reminder that we are taking a recording of today's webinar. So if you wanted to share it with your teams later on, uh, that will be available later on this afternoon on callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded dash webinars. Uh, so delighted to get into uh, today's webinar and be able to hand over to our first speaker. So Sarah, I will stop sharing. Uh, perfect. There we go. So picture the scene. You had bad news from the family last night. Your coworker is permanently complaining about everything and you've just got off the phone from a long and tricky call and you know that it's messed up your stats for the day. <sighs> Take a big deep breath. You force on a smile. Good morning, you're speaking to Hannah. How can I help you today? And the person on the other end of the phone opens with a torrent of abuse. What you'd like to say is, well, screw you too. But instead, you take another deep breath, force the smile and start to placate him. Now, if you work in or with contact centres, you know that this is a day-to-day -day reality. 
As I said earlier, I'm Sarah Morgan. I founded Lukiat Coaching to essentially help leaders and teams um, be better and to, to really achieve their goals. And I work one-to-one -one and with teams to enable them to do that. And today I want to talk to you about emotional load, as I've described in my opening, uh, opening story, and the impact that that has on employee engagement and employee experience, but also ultimately on customer experience and customer satisfaction. And I'll leave you with some, some takeaways, four key areas that you can focus on to, uh, to make this a better experience for our employees. So the emotional load that contact center teams can carry is immense. Uh, it's a phrase that's been hijacked of late, emotional labor you might have heard used to describe the, um, the mental load of carrying family logistics that's, that's used, particularly in relation to working mothers, but working parents as a whole. It's actually a broader term than that. It was first used in 1983 when American sociologist Arlie Hochschild used it in her book, The Managed Heart. And she described it as inducing or suppressing feeling in order to sustain the outward countenance that produces a proper state of mind in others. In other words, squashing yourself into a box to make sure that other people aren't upset or, or offended in any way. So it's about painting that smile on your face to make sure that you don't upset your customer. It's about holding yourself, adapting yourself into what you perceive as an acceptable professional persona. And sometimes we can make that a much tighter box than it really needs to be. And it's an issue that impacts people across a whole range of roles across an organization, but it's so prevalent in customer facing roles. In my coaching practice, I quite often work with individuals who spent years bending to fit into um, what they perceive as the professional box. Um, and they've lost sense of, of who their authentic self is. Um, they're tired, they're stressed, they're overwhelmed with a sense of imposter syndrome because they're not being themselves. And I think we can do a lot better for our contact center staff and we can help equip them with tools that will, will hold them in great, um, great stead in the future as well. The emotional load that they carry is, is large because they often bear the brunt of customer upset and quite often they have the least sense of control over their day-to-day -day reality as well. So I am hoping that everyone listening at least wants to do the right thing by their teams. And I suspect most of you are aware of that really strong link between, um, between that customer experience and your employee experience. Um, they, they share a, a mutually dependent relationship. But if you start with your employee experience, it will give you a really big impact on your, your customer experience as well. And it begins with employee engagement, which let's be honest, is an area a lot of companies got some room for improvement. Research has shown that companies that have got an excellent customer experience have employees who are one and a half times more engaged than companies with a less satisfactory customer experience. And companies with highly engaged employees outperform their competitors by 147%. And yet research conducted in 2015 showed that only 32% of employees really felt engaged in their work. So clearly there's a big gap um, that we can bridge there. And companies often struggle with employee engagement because really creating that employee centric culture is much more than having a great HR team, good remuneration, great office perks, good holidays. There's a real emotional uh, component to fully engaging your, your employees and it needs an investment into each individual's personal and professional development. And companies that do this really well leave their employees feeling respected and deeply trusted for the work that they do as well as just for the people that they are. Now, old school contact center performance management was very much command and control, time-based metrics, so time to pick up, average handling time, wrap time, volume, volume, volume. And that's exhausting for your teams and it can really impact the customer experience when customers get the sense that they're being hurried off the phone. Add to that the emotional load that your uh, contact center staff are carrying and churn rates are quite often the highest amongst contact centers. And the financial impact of that is, is substantial. So across the entire industry, contact centers in the UK replace about 26% of their staff every year. 
and that's as opposed to 15% across all roles in the UK. So clearly that additional 11% of replacing staff has quite a high cost. So the return on investment of implementing a truly employee centric policy, which will reduce that um, is quite clear. So assuming it's reasonable to believe that helping people deal with the consequences of emotional labor is going to improve team morale, it's going to reduce team turnover. And there's two facets to it. One is helping them better cope with the reality of emotional labor. It's a, it's a fact that it happens. And the second part is more deeply embedded in, in the overall employee experience. So what can we do about it? Firstly is recognizing that all organizations have what, what are called display norms. So they're the, the culture and the, the ways of operating within the business that are deemed as acceptable people are taught how to act and actually in a contact center quite often they're literally given a script and that's really helpful in very standard scenarios but it can lead to people feeling that they've got to suppress elements of themselves and that can leak out into um, areas of concern or, or poor behaviors in other areas so senior leaders can role model really great empathic behavior and show um, show the team how and when to process those emotional um, reactions that can be really powerful. I guess because my background's technology, um, I brought a lot of problem solving into, into the contact centres and operational teams that I've, I've worked with. And giving teams the autonomy to be able to go off script, enable them to develop their problem solving skills so that they can really dig into um, the problem with the customer when they need to. It builds their confidence and also, in a lot of cases, can help get to the root cause of the issue before the customer is overly upset and resolving those issues then before it, it leads to any negative emotions. Emotional intelligence as well. If your advisors are better able to understand where the customers are coming from and engage in deep reflective practice after their call, so understanding what their responses were, what the customers' responses were and why, it can really help reduce um, the, the exhaustion that can come from, from dealing with challenging customers. And floor walkers have always traditionally been there to help with technical and, and um, expertise, but I believe that there's a, a role that they can play to help with that reflective practice after a, a challenging call as well and to coach, um, coach advisors through that. Sharing knowledge and sharing successes. There are always people in the contact center who are brilliant at managing difficult customers without it dragging them down and without them having an emotional response to it themselves. Uh, encourage them to share how they do that and why they do that and people will be able to learn from that. And then the other piece of it, I think is really critical, which is recognition. So bringing a recognition into of the emotional labor and the emotional load that, that people carry into the performance evaluation process. Who deals with it really well? How well do you deal with angry people? What um, tolerance and patience do you show? And by rewarding those behaviors, again, it encourages people to proactively manage their emotional responses and their, their own mental health. So then when we want to truly develop an employee centric culture, um, what else can we do? Daniel Pink did an amazing piece of work looking at what um, motivates individuals to do great work. And he evidenced really clearly that the, the primary driver performance at work isn't remuneration. As long as people are being paid fairly for the knowledge and experience that they're bringing, um, that isn't what, what drives performance. What drives performance is autonomy, mastery and purpose. So do you give your team some flexibility about how they do their work and how they handle their customers? Do you allow them to go off script where it's appropriate? Are they given the training and the development that they need to develop that mastery um, to become deeply proficient, both technically and in the soft skills that they need to perform their duties? Do they have a deep affinity with the purpose of the business or do they feel that their, um, their role gives them a sense of purpose? By ensuring that your teams have a sense of autonomy, mastery and purpose, you will get better performance. And Pink actually went on to prove that for work that has some degree of complexity, so isn't entirely transactional, actually, the more you pay people, the, more, the less they perform well, 
if they don't have that sense of autonomy, mastery and purpose. It's really, really fascinating work. So Rachel, now I think it's time for a poll. Yes, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, so I will share that poll now. So the um, poll question is, since March, which of the following initiatives have you run? So it's multiple choice, so you can vote on more than one. Is it buddying agents? Have you done employee focus groups? Have you done motivational games? Uh, have you done virtual huddles? Or have you run a wellness session? Uh, Sarah, I don't know what you, uh, being a betting person, what would you uh, suggest might come out? Um, I'd really hope things like buddying agents and wellness sessions are going to be up there. Um, the vir virtual huddles and motivational games are, are kind of standard, but hopefully people are thinking slightly broader now that there's so much remote working as well. Fab. Well, uh, I will share the results now. So uh, actually what's come out on top is 68% uh, virtual huddles. Uh, we've got 53% motivational games, 52% wellness sessions. Very pleased with that. 38% buddying agents and 32% employee focus groups. Uh, you're nodding your head pleased with that then Sarah yeah no it's it's great and it's great to see that the majority you know a lot of people are doing more than just one thing as well which is really good uh, yeah. different people will engage in different types of of activities better as well so that's really good Fab. well I will let you uh, I'll stop sharing the results and let you carry on thank you great thank you so other things that we can do to build a great employee centric culture um, there's the, oh, are my slides going to click on? Yes. Oh, <laughs> technical <laughs> fail. Technical fail. <laughs> Don't um, worry. <laughs> yeah, so the first thing is um, assistance programmes. I've always advocated providing access to stress management and emotional health services, as we saw just then quite a few people looking at wellness programmes. Um, mental health first aiders, mindfulness programs, all of those sorts of things are really beneficial. Um, so it's great to see that so many of you are, are thinking along those lines. Communication and feedback is obviously critical. Um, as I said earlier, contact centre teams often feel like they've got very little control over their day to day and have less face time with the senior team than many other departments as well. So giving them that face time with the, the senior team, giving them the opportunity for two-way communication and feedback is, is important. And I'm sure a lot of you have implemented core listening strategies, but enabling people from other parts of the organization and senior team from other parts of the organization, so whether that's the tech teams, marketing, sales, wherever it is across the business, to come and sit with the team and listen into calls and to understand the emotional impact of some of those calls and the, the strength that's needed by the contact centre uh, teams to get through that can be, and celebrating that can be, can be quite empowering. And the single most effective thing I've done in, in larger contact centres and operations teams um, is the opportunity to feedback and to really off gas. So I'm a fan of alliteration, so I used to call it sit down with Sarah, but it could be natter with Nick or coffee with Caroline. Um, and I did this monthly and one person from every team would come into it. Um, we'd have a, a room booked with snacks for an hour and a half. No team leaders, no managers, no one else at all. Just literally people from each team and me, no agenda, no holes barred. It was literally for the team to be able to share whatever was on their mind, give me feedback, um, vent, um, bring ideas. And after the, uh, after the meeting, I'd email everybody across the whole department and share what we talked about and what I could do something about and what I couldn't do something about and why. So obviously every idea isn't implementable. I'm not sure whether that's a word, but it is now. Um, but if I couldn't do something, if something wasn't going to be practical or wasn't going to be able, able to be done, I made sure that that was really clear as well. Um, and I, I used to get brilliant feedback that that FaceTime was, was really appreciated. The next piece is coaching. So great side-by-side -side coaching. Mike mentioned it earlier. And it is harder in a, um, in a virtual setting, but I know that we can leverage technologies. So a, an agent is still able to, you know, virtually raise their hand and ask for some help. 
or to be able to sit down with a, a coach or a TL afterwards and, and um, go through that deep reflective practice and deep reflection on, on the call, what went well, what didn't go well and, and how they're feeling about it. And then finally, metrics. Um, and I'll apologise now for the, um, for the acronym. I, I haven't uh, expanded that out. But what you measure is what you get. Whatever you're measuring is going to drive the behaviours within the contact centre. So if you've got pure time-based metrics, all you're going to get is volume. Having customer experience and employee experience at the absolute heart of your metrics um, will bring some, some balance into your behaviours. Clearly, you can't go too far the other way. It can't all be about cups of tea and sympathy. There needs to be some work done as well. But I think having that balance will, will really lead to better outcomes. So used appropriately, all of these strategies can take the pain out of um, the emotional load that the contact centre staff need to, to carry at times. When problems are addressed appropriately, the teams then feel a real sense of satisfaction because it can help the customers resolve their problems um, and get to the right answers more quickly. And that all drives performance naturally. So by reducing the impact of the emotional load, providing a way for them to release that sense um, and, and have some empathy for where they're at, drives that employee engagement. Then balancing your KPIs and your metrics across the team allowing those human responses and making sure that's really strong communication strategy will continue to drive up employee engagement and that then leads to a great customer experience you've got high employee satisfaction which means you've got a great customer experience and great customer satisfaction because at the end of the day you frontline staff are the face of your organization that's who your customer sees the vast majority of the time so to recap my slides have decided to be slow again, sorry. Um, so to recap, communicate, make sure that you've got two-way communication with the team and that there's real psychological safety so that they can express exactly what's going on for them and that you promise that follow-up. Rewarding them through normal recognition, but also through performance evaluation, reward great um, emotional intelligence for your team. Develop them, develop their problem solving skills and their emotional intelligence capabilities and support them. So ensure that you've, they've got access to coaching, that they've got the tools to be able to participate in that reflective practice and making sure that they've got access to things like mental health first aiders and mindfulness programmes. Thank you all for your time and your attention. Um, are there any questions? Fab. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that. Um, we are, let me just, uh, there we go. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, just a reminder that we are going to uh, come to our quiz it's, uh, now. So you need to be logged into our chat room. So uh, that's on callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat or just type in cch.chat. Maybe while you're there, you could share in one or two words, what did you like best about Sarah's presentation? Um, I thought it was brilliant. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I mean, I loved all the quotes um, and everything like that. Um, I think my favorite one was uh, sit down with Sarah or I, I'm going with relax with Rachel is my new one uh, to have an open table discussion, no holds barred. I mean, maybe it might have to be more reach out with Rachel, but never mind. <laughs> um, and also very interesting to hear kind of 20%, 26% of contact centre staff leave every year compared to 15% across all roles in the UK. Um, a very interesting stat. So thank you very much for sharing that with us. Uh, lots of other things. So I'm sure everyone's writing in the chat room all their favourite bits. So for the quiz, uh, just a reminder, the buttons are in our chat room, so you do need to be there. You need to use uh, these buttons for the answers. So just like this, um, when you want to uh, click the answer, you need to be in the chat room, cch.chat. So I'm going to come across to our quiz now. There we go. So uh, we've got about half the audience. Um, so uh, if you want to take part, Last chance, uh, there's a bottle of champagne or a box of chocolates or an Amazon gift card. 
um if you are we're not allowed to take part Bishop. <laughs> no sadly <laughs> you've already seen the answers mike it just wouldn't be fair <laughs> just want the audience to make sure they understand so. <laughs> yes so uh, it's www.callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat or cch.chat. It is in a separate window. Uh, and just a reminder, you need to use the buttons in the chat room. So I'm going to start. So first question, true or false, employees who feel their voice is heard are 2.3 times more likely to feel empowered to perform their best work. Is it A, true or B, false? So it's uh, true or false, employees who feel their voice is heard are 2.3 times more likely to feel empowered to perform their best work. A, true or B, false. So last chance to vote. Still coming through. And right. Uh, so actually most people getting this wrong. Uh, it was a, a crafty one. It is in fact double that with employees who feel their voices heard are 4.6 times more likely to feel empowered to perform their best work. So Alex is uh, currently in the lead. Uh, so next question. In his famous book, Drive, Daniel Pink shares three elements of intrinsic motivation. Which of the following is not one of those elements? And uh, hopefully you've been paying attention because Sarah mentioned this several times. So uh, in his famous book, Drive, Daniel Pink shares three elements of intrinsic motivation. Which of the following is not one of those elements? Is it A, autonomy, B, mastery, C, potential or D, purpose? Uh, so, uh, wait for people to come through. Mike's smiling. <laughs> so, uh, which of these was an, is not one of the elements of intrinsic motivation? Is it A, autonomy, B, mastery, C, potential, or D, purpose? Uh, so, most people getting that one right, actually. So, uh, the correct answer is C, potential. Uh, Daniel Pink's model casts away the idea of reward and punishment as motivational tools and instead focuses on what it takes to make people really care about what they do. Sarah's nodding. <laughs> so, uh, scores so far. Oh, Teresa's just overtaken, Alex. So, uh, still time to go. Uh, so what percentage of U.S. employees are burned out at work? Is it A, 21%, is it B, 41%, C, 61% or D, 81%? So that's what percentage of U.S. employees are burnt out at work? Is it A, 21%, B, 41%, C, 61% or D, 81%? So vote now last chance and uh, right oh um, B and C actually coming out uh, very much equally uh, so the correct answer is actually C 61% uh, so the stat came from a report by career build which also found that nearly one in five have vacated vacation days unused at the end of the working year uh, Teresa still out uh, in the lead uh, last question so uh, hopefully you've all been downloading our, our survey reports. So at the end of, the tw of 2019, which of the following culture boosting initiatives was the most widely used in contact centers? Was it A, buddying agents, B, flexible shifts, C, knowledge champions, or D, spot prizes? So this was in one of our survey reports at the end of last year. So I'm sure you've all downloaded it. <laughs> if not, I'm sure we can put a link into the uh, chat room and share it with you possibly after the quiz but uh, at the end of 2019 which of the following culture boosting initiatives was the most widely used in contact centers was it a buddying agents b flexible shifts c knowledge champions or d spot prizes uh, so Ah, most people getting this one wrong. Uh, so it was actually knowledge champions. So C, according to an autumn 2019 survey by Call Centre Helper, 63.1% of contact centres were using a knowledge champions initiative, although all of these initiatives can work well, as you can see, lots coming out. So congratulations to Teresa 16. We will uh, be in touch afterwards. Uh, you are the winner of our quiz. Uh, so well done. Uh, we are going to go 
back to our top tips and find out. I can see that the chat room's been humming away quite happily. So uh, we will go through some of these. So we've had a tip sent in saying, we have a spiff board with loads of prizes. Team members earn tickets for great stats, supervisor recognition, or hidden in communications. When they earn enough tickets, they can pick an envelope off the spiff board. When someone picks something from the board, we take pictures and send to the team. Uh, Sarah, what are your thoughts on this one? I think it's great and it's brilliant that um, it's not just about stats, so it's recognition for individuals and, and communication as well. Um, anything that that keeps everyone away from the pure volume metrics is is brilliant. Uh, and I guess this works when it's uh, when it's remote as well, which is really nice. Yeah. Uh, so Alex has sent in a tip. Uh, she says uh, encourage openness by facilitating an a anonymous oh dear suggestions for improvement across the business people being able to get things off their chest in a safe environment is a good step to being emotionally available to their customers uh, so we've got a question in from claire who said how can we help with emotional load when they're working from home if they don't open up or reach out uh, sarah i don't know if you wanted to take this one yeah, sure. It's really hard. I think um, partly it's about talking to each and every person in your team and finding out what they want. So not everybody um, is going to react well or want to open up one to one in a in a Zoom call with their, their manager. Some people might prefer to talk to somebody in a different team or have a different way of um, of engaging. Uh, so I think talking to every individual and finding out what works for them is is absolutely critical as the first step and then giving them different ways of um, of letting off steam and, and off gassing but continuing to check in on them on a regular basis make sure that doesn't feel like you're checking up on them um, but that you are checking in on them yeah I, I think the different ways you know sometimes via video it can be a bit too much whereas you know on a phone call or in a chat it might be a lot easier to um, you know, say what they're really feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Fab. So we've had a, a tip in from Teresa, obviously go for the, for the double. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we run saying we run a new starters network to help groups of contact centers, new staff bond and learn together. One of new, one of new starters runs this and we give them time to do this. It's up to them how they run it. Uh, Mike, what are your thoughts on this one? You're nodding. Well, I just think it sounds, sounds innovative and um, it's a good idea. Um, I'm curious about the remote factor now, so that's kind of falling into all my thoughts every time. Yeah. But, um, you know, any, anything like this that can allow the, the, the groups to bond and build their confidence together and then obviously to communicate, I think is all very, very helpful. Yeah, I think we discussed on one of our previous webinars, Mike, kind of having different groups, you know, we have Slack and different conversation mm -hmm. groups and things like that yeah. might work quite well for a remote. Yeah. And they're kind um, of open permanently. They just, they just sit there and we can just chat whoever's available at that time. So it's yeah, nice. <laughs> Uh, so Laura sent in a tip saying we have set up a virtual break room in Zoom where agents can join during their break time and chat with others who happen to be in the room. Similar to a break room at an office might be, it's helped make the agents feel more together. Yeah, I think that one's a brilliant one. Uh, you're, you're both actually nodding, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and I know people who have um, like a virtual buddy, so they literally can have a Zoom open with each other all of the time so obviously it's muted when it needs to be but they can always look up and see that that their buddy's there and working away and and they can um they can help each other out if that yeah or, or waving wildly that they need help <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, so we've had a question from Charlie, uh, which is what is everybody including in their wellness sessions? Uh, I mean, Sarah, I, I don't know whether this, this one might probably be better for you. Yeah, so I think it's very similar to the, the question about how to, to help someone who's not opening up. It's about variety. So understanding what people need. So for me, I, my mental health is at its best when I'm physically exercising. So having um, a conversation with a colleague while I'm going for a walk is much better than sitting and having a coffee or a virtual lunch. So wellness sessions that focus on mental health, physical well-being, calm, meditation, yoga, but also maybe a, you know, a virtual run club 
Um, it's about making sure that there's, again, something for everyone that, that taps into what helps them feel at their best. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so Claire sent in a question saying, we have mental well-being champions in our company who arrange workshops, write blogs and have monthly drop-in sessions, but engagement is quite low. How can we increase engagement to support people without forcing it on them? Um, I mean, I don't know, Mike, if this is uh, <laughs> a strong point of yours, but... Well, I suppose... I... <laughs> I mean, like, um, you know, is there a stigma like with with like um, with with the with the title? You know, just in the context of, if I feel I, if I feel I'm engaging with this, do I have a problem? That maybe is, do I have a problem? <laughs> and maybe yeah. reaching into that team is kind of signposting me to think that I do have a problem, and I don't think I do have a problem. Did you understand my my point? Yeah. So, but but I, I appreciate, but from Claire's point of view, what well, how how can you help uh, get the engagement better? And um, and I don't know whether that's through team leaders or through um, you know, maybe like a like an, an even separate Zoom. I don't know, um, but again, what would you call it? <laughs> it's kind of curious. I I empathise there with the, with the, the, the dilemma. And and Sarah, I'm guessing you know you were saying doing different things. So you know, obviously, yoga isn't going to be for everyone, and certainly running isn't for everyone. But maybe the person in your office who runs 10ks for fun on a Sunday might be the person to to lead that group. But uh, you know yeah. the and so doing that so uh, any other suggestions i think again it's ask people why aren't they engaging in it what do they want from it is it that actually they don't want the workshops and the blogs they want something else so i would encourage um you know whether it's an anonymous form for feedback or or conversation get feedback from people about what they do want what is going to be meaningful and useful for them fab Thank you both. Uh, so one final question from uh, another Sarah actually. Uh, would welcome some ideas on how to facilitate two-way feedback, particularly with coaching and quality feedback. Uh, Mike, any thoughts? Um, yeah, it's an uh, it's interesting sort of um, dilemma really. And um, technically, if you will, there's, there's some work going on to, to try and make this easier. So we've been We've been kind of very used to, um, you know, building our sort of coaching techniques and and and, and tools, if you will, around a, a way of working. But now that um, predominantly remote working is how the the future is looking, um, we, if you like, as a as a tech house, need to kind of figure out how can we make that more useful, and more helpful. So, um, be encouraged, Sarah, that there is kind of stuff on the way, just particularly to address this. Um, but certainly, those things like this, sort of like the mini virtual groups, could be helpful or maybe assigning myself to work with the agent for a morning or like or a shift um, so that I'm kind of going through a full sort of um, not just a individual interaction, but actually a, a couple of hours of, of that individual's life could be an interesting way to kind of gather that sort of more deeper insights than just the, the expected ones from a from a quality form. Brilliant. And I think this is the uh, perfect opportunity. We will come back, as you can see, lots of tips coming through. Uh, but we're going to ask mm -hmm. a quick poll. So let me uh, oh, find the poll and um, launch that one. So we're asking which of the following tools has the biggest impact on agent engagement? So it's just single uh, choice. So we've got collaboration tools, desktop consolidation, gamification, Omnichannel or WFM system, uh, Mike. You you know I'm going to ask the question. What what do you think is uh, <laughs> going to come out? Yeah, and there's, there's clearly a, a technical bent to this, so that's okay. That's fine. It's good. Um, <laughs> but if you like, um, you know, I, th I think things like your know, desktop consolidation is really boring, but but it does actually make the agent's life better. So. Um, it would be nice to sort of see that get a good score, but it ain't jazzy, so it probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. So uh, I'm going <laughs> to share the results. So uh, collaboration tools, uh, 46%. Gamification, 23%. You'll be pleased to know, 80% desktop consolidation, 8% Omnichannel, and 5% WFM system. Uh, pleased with uh, your, your desktop consolidation then, Mike? Yeah, absolutely yeah and, and and you know like we sarah kind of touched on it earlier as well we kind of we, we should be at the point now where the collaboration tools if you like are kind of taken for granted um because they're you know they are there we know that they're there they're kind of easy to access and you know from that perspective it should be um so but but you know i'm pleased to see that uh consolidation is in there <laughs> oh uh 
Right, so I'm going to stop sharing and then head over. So, yep, perfect, Mike. Uh, great chance. I'm going to hand over the baton to you. Excellent. So let me just screen share. I just confirm that you're seeing that okay? I can, yes. Perfect. Good. Okay. Um, isn't this a great um, uh, topic? And um, thanks for putting it together, Rachel and uh, Sarah. Really, really insightful uh, content so far. And um, it's great to be part of it, really. It's, um, it's a perspective, if, if, if you like, on the kind of the agents and I suppose team leaders kind of working life that, that often, you know, needs to be kind of explored more, I think. And uh, from that perspective, it's good to bring it to the, to the audience. And, um, and for us, as well as tech providers, we've got to figure out how we adapt and accommodate and build this into our, into our thinking. So um, really, really good. And um, hopefully I can complement the, uh, the good work so far. Um, so uh, like I said before, I'm Mike from Genesis taking this sort of tech angle to, to, this, to this topic. Um, certainly I, I think, you know, whether we like it or not, um, technology is kind of complicated. Um, so from that perspective, it, it kind of tends to be challenging. Um, and, uh, you know, from that, from that perspective, we try and kind of make it easier, but, but the contact center is a rich place for technology. So to that end, there's often quite a lot of tech elements in there. So therefore it, it just, I think lends itself or it has in the past, maybe lent itself more to being technically complicated. Um, however, I think the, the, the fact of the matter is, and let me just make sure I'm being able to drive correctly here. Yeah. Okay. So the fact of the matter is that, um, for the adoption of technology, then you know simplicity really is the is, is the key. And uh, if you make it easy, people will pick up, use it, run with it, and they will do it over and over again. Uh, if you don't make it easy, the, the opposite will happen. So people get frustrated, they get irked, they get tense, and um, and they get you know like it's just they become like uh, they get frustrated that they're in the situation with some dumb tech. They think it's kind of dumb tech. It's probably trying to do something useful, but actually it feels pretty dumb because I've got to copy or paste or you know, open this other window to get that information or etc. So from that perspective, as an agent, that kind of just feels dumb to me. I mean, why are you asking me to do it like 70 times a day? Um, so from that perspective, that to me isn't simple. That's not easy. That's, that's actually putting a burden onto the agent because I haven't figured out my tech issues. Okay, so that's kind of my perspective on that. But then the other angle about simplicity as well is the actual consumer, okay, the user. So you know, how I you know, consume my uh, providers, okay? So I'm a, an energy customer and I want to uh, you know, get more energy. Um, you know, how I interact with that brand is, is, is really important. And, and it's just energy is an example, it could be anything. But if I'm not feeling like it's easy to kind of do business with you, then I'm kind of being more interested now in talking to which and figure out what's my switching options or um, you know, I'm, I'm, my, my curiosity to go elsewhere is heightened immediately. So, it's got to be simple for the internal agent, like the colleague, but it's equally got to be simple for the, for the kind of consumer, the customer. And from that perspective, they have to be if you like the, the, the dominant uh, places of thinking around tech, I, I would say, in, in, in the context of the contact center, customer experience, and trying to achieve, if you like, success with creating a, uh, conditions that the customer and the agents love. So we mentioned before, Rachel, it was the, the last webinar, actually, we were talking about the country center of the future. And um, Genesis are embarking on this experience as a service kind of notion, and it's kind of picking up some great traction. And so far, we're getting some good feedback from customers. And, and the idea really is that we start to kind of get back to the drawing board about what we're trying to achieve here, you know, and, and, and really, really take a hard look at uh, how we're sort of, you know, how we're fulfilling for what our customers are asking us to fulfill. So a bit like, what Sarah said, like listening to what the customer wants and then working hard to, to bring that to the surface. And what's clearly been sort of um, absent, I would say, from the work that, that, that we've found is that the focus is absolutely there about, you know, um, managing the volumes, I think is like Sarah referred to it, you know, the, 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 the quantities, the speed of answer, the, those metrics are all kind of like absolutely there and kind of expected and given. But the ones that aren't really sort of prioritized are this notion, if you like, of empathy. And, and from our perspective, that's the kind of part that we're starting to sort of latch our thinking onto more. And we know that if we can start to build a empathetic relationship with the customer and kind of be in step with the customer, um, and kind of probably, you know, we, we, 
you know, we, we can kind of anticipate the fact that this customer is boiling before they even connect with the individual. Well, then that's, that's kind of important. But being able to be empathetic would allow me to act differently. Um, maybe sort of connect them with the last person that they spoke to because they give that person a good satisfaction survey. Or you know, maybe escalate immediately and kind of tell the customer I'm escalating this because of the circumstance. But empathetic is like demonstrating to the customer that you're listening to their situation, doing something about it. And from that, if you will, the respect will start to grow from your customer. And obviously with that will build loyalty and then that starts to kind of build into this idea of a personalized relationship or if you like a personalized experience. Now the, the, the challenge with this is I've got, you know, Mike, I've got 75, you know, 100,000 calls or 70, 75 million customers or you know, like the, the volumes here become extraordinary. And we're absolutely, you know, we are fully understand that. And, and also if you like the media types are also extraordinary. So they, the, the messaging channel choices are there, the, 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 the typical old fashioned calls, inbound, outbound, um, chats, emails, et cetera, you know, they're all sort of part of this thinking. Um, but it's being able to kind of scale this idea of being able to react to each individual customer's circumstance at that time, if you like, becomes the, um, the real prize and the real sort of demonstrating to your customer that you are listening. Now there's, there's, there's lots of tools that have been built around this to kind of bring it to, to, to reality. Uh, clearly on the right hand side, this idea of the customer and employee data becomes super critical. And, and the data that we get from the, the employees and the agents in the contact center is just abundant. Okay, so we have the terabytes of recordings, that's all kind of there and a given. Um, but we also need to get better, if you like, with our customer data. And um, not just the fact that we know what your subscription is and we know when it's going to expire and we know we're trying to bash you for a renewal. Um, but actually understanding what the customer is doing, like on your website and incorporating all of that activity into your thinking. Um, understanding what your customer is getting from your logistics colleagues or your logistics outsourced partner. Uh, understanding, you know, understanding everything about that customer's touch with you as a brand and factoring that into our thinking. And only with that am I in a situation then to be able to kind of tune my responses and tune my behavior and demonstrate to the customer that I'm in step with them because I have that amount of information kind of readily available. So as you can imagine, there's, there's a bit of a, you know, like the hefty lift of, 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 of information here that we have to manage. And that's where the, the green AI kind of part steps in to kind of help us lift that kind of volume of detail. And, you know, the devil is in the detail, right? And, and if you get it wrong, it can be embarrassing. It can be, you know, and embarrassing in, in, in CX is, you know, posts on, on, on social media, which are pretty, um, you know, challenging, if you like, for brands to, to, to react to. So from that perspective, you've got to get your detail and you've got to be able to manage your detail and you've got to be able to drive good decision-making with the detail in order to bring this to life. And that's, they're the kind of visions and strategies that we're working on to kind of help our customers and how we connect, what we handle, those engagement types, I don't really care. It could be a simple SMS just to remind me that there's a delivery happening at two o'clock or a simple SMS to remind me that uh, thanks for your order. And by the way, it's fulfilled or something or something. Just you know, these simple things uh, build this kind of like a personalized experience for your customer. And that's really what we feel we, we, we kind of, that to me, if you like, would be the kind of experience that customers would love. Now, um, that's kind of fine, if you will. But <clears throat> when we kind of look at the, um, so, so, so think about the, the, my comments so far about the outside customer, <clears throat> thinking more now about my colleagues, 71% of execs would say that employee engagement is critical to their company's success, which is super. 69% um, of employees would say that they work harder if they were better appreciated. Okay, so that's, that's, that's like an interesting sort of um, perspective really on the opportunity uh, in the context of managing and working with my teams. <clears throat> and then in the context of you know, employees who are not engaged. Well, some research from Aon Hewitt back in 2016, um, they're kind of highlighting the fact that, you know, more than 62% of employees are not committed to their organization. So in a way, if you like, the, 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 the staff, if you like, are hungry and willing and able, I suppose, really. But if the organization isn't kind of like embracing and kind of helping them and sort of like solving their problems, then why should they feel, should they feel loyal? So, you know, by putting this into, you know, pound, shillings and pence, really, the cost of disengaged employees becomes very, very stark, you know, and your satisfaction increases, sorry, satisfaction decreases, uh, quality defects, whether that's, you know, through how they interact with, with colleagues, with customers, 
but also that sort of high turnover, and that's kind of falling back onto the, the commentary from Sarah earlier. So in the context of getting this right, it becomes very, very critical. And, and one thing I would say is that often the kind of the contact center becomes the sort of like the, the, the area where the problems of the business surface. Now, the problems of the business can be things that the contact center teams and managers can address and fix and organize and structure and you know, build and, and resolve. But there's also many problems of the business that ends up in the contact center, which are nothing to do with the contact center. And from that perspective, if the rest of the organization is not listening and, and, and absorbing, if you like, the, the facts that are coming across from my customer facing colleagues, and then if you like addressing those problems, whether it's a logistics problem or whether it's a product problem, that then starts to really get into the minds of the contact center staff because, well, hang on guys, we told you this two weeks ago, we told you this two months ago, we told you this two years ago, and it's still not getting resolved. So therefore, why should I feel uh, anything less than dissatisfied? So really we have to think about how important, if you will, the, you know, if, if you wanted like a, a health check on the business, take a reading from the contact center and take a reading from your contact center staff. And that could give you a good sense of how the overall business is doing rather than just the actual contact center itself. And then I kind of wanted to, to touch on the fact that we're not just talking about, okay, well, to resolve this, let's just hire more people because that's, that's my problem, surely. Um, if things aren't going so well in the contact center, just give me a business case, I'll hire 10 more and we'll be fine. And, and that's really, again, I think you're falling back on the wrong response because it's not about um, if you like the volumes, really, this is about how the business is structured to fulfill its obligations to its customers. And if there are elements that are broken, they need to be fixed. But if they are fixed and we are running smoothly in flight, then everybody as an employee base across the whole organization should be well engaged. And I think all that's happening, if you like, in the context center where that's not happening, is the fact that something elsewhere is broken that needs to be resolved. But we have to kind of broaden the subject beyond this notion, if you like, of optimization and uh, your people management. Um, it's really more about you know, helping, if you like, the, the voice of the employee, the, employee, uh, the listening. You know, maybe gamification is a tool to help surface some of those issues. But I think being able to kind of help and I suppose spend more time listening, uh, building that sort of relationship, albeit remote, becomes maybe more critical and, and, and more essential. Uh, but by no means is the answer in better forecasts than planning. Okay, just, just, just be absolutely clear about that. It's a bigger subject that we are looking to resolve here. And that engagement kind of is a much wider sort of responsibility than just a forecasting tool. Here's some like, examples, if you will, that's kind of come across from some previous research. If you look at the sort of um, the optimization you know, strategy, shall we say, of how to address the problems of you know, goals and plans with reports, reviews, corrective actions, you know, there is a well sort of trodden path there of, of, of what would have been and you know, probably in the past has been quite successful way to kind of you know, manage your way out of that sort of solid approach. But if you look at the kind of the, the language difference when you compare it to the current thinking, and this is coming from Deloitte on the right hand side, you know, for me as, a, as an individual employee of this company, if I'm getting language and training which is talking about my belonging and my alignment and my growth, um, I'm far more sort of interested and encouraged and curious and engaged, I suppose, really, just to get to the point, um, because it sounds like you're kind of working to try and help me, <clears throat> support me, give me a sort of sense of a long-term future here. <clears throat> I don't want to be drifting into the quadrant of your, of your employee or your onboarding that gets dismissed in, in sort of like a, you know, four weeks' time. <clears throat> so then I kind of mentioned several times so far the idea of AI and what's kind of that got to do with it. And, and really with the, the, the notion of AI, just, just consider it like a, a tool that's in the bag of our sort of software as a, as a sort of provider. <clears throat> but what I wanted to show with this graphic really is how AI is kind of being used for us every day in the top half, if you like, in the orange segment where we're engaging with customers and you know, how we sort of engage with them and what we're using within the sort of toolkit to help us deliver better engagement using AI. But then equally look at the um, employee experience down below. So again, just, 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 as, just as equally, there's a, a bunch of toolkits and, and, and capabilities and enhancements that allow us to leverage the, that, you know, that abundant power of AI to make the agent's life better. And from that perspective, I think you know, these type of investments help us, these type of improvements help us. And, and with that, then I think we'll get that you know, much closer to the, uh, the environment technically where you know, the customers love it and the agents love it. And that's clearly the goal.
So just trying to bring a sort of a, a wrap up frame here, really, and that is <clears throat> we kind of know what we need to do. We kind of know how to do it. So really, it's just about, I think, the execution of it. And um, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, like I say, once we have the, um, the understanding right, if you will, of the, the problems you want to address, then I think we will achieve the goals that we need to fulfill. But remember, like I said, it's not just about the, the for me, if you like, I, the, the most common thing I've seen is the highest drama in the contact center comes from something broken elsewhere. So we need that kind of exact sponsorship to go and resolve. And I think by doing that, we get more to a managed and sort of like a plain sailing operation. Forgive my dry, my dryness and uh, back to you, Rachel, thanks. Brilliant, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, I've taken a slink before. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, before I get in, I'm just going to put up a poll. Uh, so uh, there we go. Um, so if you would like to see a demonstration of the Genesis solution, if you just uh, mark in the poll now. Uh, thank you so much, Mike. A lot of great takeaways. Um, I'm a big fan of a stat, so those are always going to be the ones that I pick up on. 69% of employees say they'd work harder if they were better appreciated, which is, you know, a really shocking stat with, uh, you know, 62% saying they're not committed to, an, to their organisation. Um, and I thought what was really interesting was, you know, the focus on the real cost of a disengaged employee. You know, it's not just, um, you know, one side is actually all the way across and and i really liked your kind of how ai helps with you know managing the details uh, of everything you know your example about um sending out a reminder email or reminder message for a parcels being delivered and and things like that so thank you very much uh, so back to our chat room um some lots of great tips coming through uh so jeff says that uh, we call sit down with sarah sessions snack and chat sessions everyone can p participate and leaders rotate through to connect with employees sarah are, are you enjoying snack and chat as well <laughs> sounds great and uh, i find that the better the snacks the more people are committed to coming along as well and I suppose with a, a virtual one, it's a BYO snack <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. for your own. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, so uh, El Claudia said, uh, our QA specialist does monthly side-by-sides with no score form. They do a cool collaboration together and have a dialogue about what is going well and what they want to work on. Uh, Mike, what are your thoughts on this one? That's good. I mean, I could, that, that, that's helpful. And um, in a way, I, I expect to see more of this because we can kind of do the no score form, if you like, in background using software these days. Um, so in a way, I think it's, it's having time, you know, side by side, I think, you know, be it virtually or physically, I think becomes much more uh, rich, really, than just having to, you know, for the, even for the team leader, having to sort of check box. It's more a case of talking and listening and observing and feeding back, if you like, and, and, and showing the agent that they are listening and helping and uh, not just like uh, scoring, if that makes sense. So uh, I kind of like that. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, so we're going to whistle through a few more. Uh, as James said, we have a dedicated room in Google Chat called Recognize and we post positive CSAT responses and acknowledge hard and appreciated work. I really like that one. Uh, Adet says, uh, hold one-to-ones twice a year to touch base with all staff and get suggestions. I think this is a bit like your Sarah's uh, meeting. Uh, so Tony said, it's currently award season. So we're holding our own virtual awards evening during a team meeting. We're encouraging the team to dress up to make a night out of it. Uh, Sarah, what are your thoughts on this one? I think it's great. Um, make a night out of it or a night in of it. But uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we don't have enough, enough opportunities to dress up. Um, I think my only word of caution is just to ensure that if everything's around evening, dress up, and therefore potentially alcohol, making sure that you're not excluding people, that you're thinking about the diversity and inclusion side of it and making sure that it feels like a safe thing to engage in if you're all teetotal or, or whatever else. Yeah. Sorry to be My a party pooper on it. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Oh, orange juice is all around. Yeah. 
Uh, so Jamie said, uh, we held a wellness session whereby each agent completed a side with a selfie and shared insights around how they'd been looking after their well-being, their lockdown guilty pleasure and what they're most excited for after lockdown. It went down really well when sharing with their peers. Uh, so I guess in England, we could all do this again. Um, so <laughs> uh, James said, every Friday, instead of doing our daily meeting, we walk a mile together. Uh, which I think is, uh, that one's a brilliant one. Um, Mike, th thoughts on that one? Like a conference call, is that, is that like a? Well, I think that's probably when they're actually in the office. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Rather well, than no walking out. <laughs> well, but then you could do, couldn't you? Like with a, well, maybe you can, this one depends upon your, <laughs> your, your how good your phone walking is. Walking Zoom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, unfortunately, we've reached the top of the hour. So uh, if you could share in the chat room in one or two words, what did you like best about the webinar? Uh, today's winning tip, drum roll, comes from Neil, who said, uh, we've recently started recording interview style videos where leaders ask team members about their top tips and honest experiences on things like building resilience and handling emotional load. So uh, well done, Neil. We'll be in touch after the webinar. Just a reminder, if you could fill in our survey, it helps us improve our webinars. The uh, replay and slides will be available later on this afternoon. Um, and uh, we are back with our final two webinars of 2020, so you can register here. But I would like to say thank you very much to our two speakers, to Sarah Morgan from Lukiat Coaching. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. It's been great. Fab. And uh, to Mike Murphy from Genesis, um, a pleasure to have you back as always. Great, appreciate it. Fab. And thank you very much to everyone for joining us. We will see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.